This is episode 96 of The Variety Artist. This is John Abrams, your host and that guy that interviews successful variety artists from around the world every single week. Just a few days until the Variety Artist shop is open, I just received my final two samples. I'll post them on my Facebook group today. Pretty soon you'll be able to get your favorite quotes from some of my favorite Variety Artist guests on mugs, t-shirts, and all sorts of swag. All right, on to my guest. Today you'll learn a little about hypnotism, but mostly you're going to find out what you need to do before you work in the U.S. or Canada. Let me rephrase that. If you're an American citizen and plan on working in Canada, or if you're a Canadian citizen and plan on working in the U.S., or if you're from another country other than Canada or the U.S., you're going to find out exactly what you need to do to cross the borders and work. It may sound confusing, but today's guest is going to straighten it all out for us. Enjoy the show. Fun fact number 783. Both of John's daughters have the travel bug. Welcome to the Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. He performs at county and state fairs. He entertains at colleges, casinos, and company picnics. He's done dozens of comedy clubs, theaters, conventions, and cruise ships. Hundreds of high school shows for grad nights and post-prom parties. He's operated an international talent agency and been an entertainment event planner for over 30 years. He has a hypnosis boot camp where you too can learn stage hypnosis. Variety artists, I give you comedy, magician, and hypnotist, the Sandman, Alan Sands. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. What's going on, Alan? What's going on? We're doing 20 different things today and talking to you in the middle. Yay, a break from the regular. Well, just from my intro, I mean, you do so many things. There, there's so much to talk to you about here. I think what we're going to do is we're going to focus on two different things. Your hypno- Well, three different things, actually. Your hypnosis and maybe some travel from Canada to the U.S., and then maybe multiple sources of income. How does that sound? Sounds like a limit of some sort. (laughs) Well, I've got to limit it somehow. Otherwise, I'd I'd have you on here for 10 hours. Exactly. All right, let's start with your hypnosis. What does your hypnosis show look like? Well, right now I'm doing a two-person comedy hypnosis show. I've brought my girlfriend into the show for the last three years. We do a show we call Misty and the Sandman. Mm Mm-hmm really is the act that I've polished for the last 23 years. And now we're just sharing the stage. She's prettier than me. And she's also got 35 years of clinical hypnosis experience. So when people come up after the show and they want to ask questions, I can push them off onto her. And she loves it. Then she also likes to do quick inductions, instant inductions. So she'll show people like at a county fair when they say, oh, hypnotize me. She'll say, okay. You know, I have some original material, of course. Mm-hmm. We all develop our own original style, especially after as many years as I've been doing it. I've gone this steampunk route, but I call it steampunk light. Mm-hmm. Neither one of us are wearing goggles, so it's not true steampunk. But it also is preparing for the year 2020 because the Roaring Twenties is going to be a really popular theme for the next 10 years. Ah. I've acquired a 1927 Model T that I've steampunked out with a vinyl wrap. We have 16 steamer trunks, which we can pile up around us and build a performance space with this three-dimensional backdrop. And we've collected miscellaneous other things that we also put in there. It's fun to pull a 20-foot trailer behind your vehicle. I wouldn't know everything fits in my car. Well, I've lived that way for 30 plus years, and now I've gone this new route of trying to expand. It's not that I think I will make more money having this huge display, but I hope that I get more work. You know, eventually it would be great if my price went up. I do have to charge a little bit more for gas because I'm towing a 20-foot trailer. Really, it's to try and make myself more attractive. Well, you have already added your, you know, Lisa. Or what does it mean? Misty. Yeah. I'm sorry, Misty. Yeah. Misty, Lisa, both. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did I, just, did I just mess something up? No, not at all. Okay. This group is not going to stalk her, but uh, she has stalkers, especially on Facebook and such. A lot of them are from Afghanistan. 
because she's an attractive blonde. Oh, well, speaking of that, is your partner is your partner? Yeah, yeah. We've been dating for three and a half years. And how did you guys meet? We met at a bar in Las Vegas, the Orleans, oh. during a hypnosis convention. Oh, yeah. We actually met a year before that. I don't remember, even though I had notes on my computer. <laughs> but she remembers. That's why I keep her around. She remembers things, and she helps me. Proofreads all my letters. I don't spell check anything. So when you guys are on stage together, do you have different, I, you've got to have different roles, right? Different roles of, of the production? Yeah, I'm still the talker and I'm still the comedian and she's there to make me look good. And she's puts in lines where she wants, we're still feeling it out. You know, I'm, I believe every show is always a work it's in progress. Mm -hmm. And we have not had a critic really direct us yet. And I know that that is on the board right now. I need to find a good director or multiple directors who sit through the show or sit and watch videos, really give us solid pointers and direct us. I'm a huge advocate of having directors help you along. You know, all the greats have directors. David Copperfield has a director. On this show, I've asked for advice from a lot of the working pros and a lot of the working pros, the number one advice is get an outside eye. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And get somebody better than you or yeah. someone that has a talent that you admire. Right. And a lot of them say, get somebody that does something different than you do. For example, they're looking at your hypnosis show, maybe some sort of a magician or, or an actor or something other than another hypnotist. Ron Campbell is my clown teacher. He's brilliant. I would love to have him look at my show. He looked at Frank Olivier and Paul Nathan's show, but then any directing is better than none. Now I had Dale Kay on here a while back, who's a fellow hypnotist and his number one thing was keeping people safe on stage. That's really, really become the mantra of a lot of hypnotists. We're all preaching it, especially those that have been at it for a while. Mm -hmm. I think we all made mistakes when we first started. And we don't want others to make the same mistakes. And we also don't want our insurances to go through the roof. That's true. Everything reflects on everyone. So if one person gets hurt and it ends up in the paper, it suddenly reflects on all of us. Yeah. A, a, a bad Santa reflects on all Santa Clauses. That's right. In fact, do you know the story of the salmonella and the snake? Not offhand, no. I do magic with live animals, and one of the animals that I do magic with is a snake. And so I get a lot of calls saying, well, can you not use the snake for this one? And I say, well, do you have a fear of snakes? And they say, no, it's because of the salmonella. Well, here's the deal. Years ago, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 20 years ago or so, there was in the paper that one kid got sick from salmonella from a snake. And all reptiles carry a small amount of salmonella, small enough where it won't get you sick. Right. But because this was in the paper and it got spread all around, now so many people are paranoid of getting salmonella from reptiles. I, I don't want to use a name, but the son of one of the great hypnotists out there showed up to a show drunk. Oh. And totally trashed the father because they have the same name. Yeah. He had jobs that canceled on him because they didn't want a drunk showing up. Oh, yeah. It wasn't his fault. It was his kid that did it. Yeah, uh, all of that, you know, reflects on the whole industry. That's it. That's a lesson for all of us. You know, show up, show up on time, do your job, be funny. Yeah, shine, shine. Shine, exactly, exactly. Now, what is the uh, Sandman Stage Hypnosis Boot Camp? What is the Sandman Stage Hypnosis Boot Camp? <laughs> I thought I said that. <clears throat> I know. I, I had to, you know, think for a moment. I take a small group of performers, usually between three and no more than seven, to a fairgrounds. I've been doing fairs for over 30 years, mm -hmm. and I realized that fairs are the perfect training ground for taking newbies and giving them the opportunity to do multiple shows in a row, day after day, with a fresh audience of, I call them virgins, people that have never been hypnotized before, or occasionally you get the hypno junkie in the audience that comes show after show after show, but that's okay, that helps too. I put them on stage. There's many ways of teaching. I believe in taking people to the end of the dock and pushing them in the water and standing there. And if they start drowning, you jump in or you throw them a rope. But they need, you know, we all need to struggle and 
What's magic about this is because you're in a group, you watch other people struggle and you go, oh, if they can struggle, so can I. Or I won't make that mistake. I just learned from watching someone else at the same level as me. Yeah. Many of these characters are clinical hypnotists or they're sword swallowers and magicians who want to expand their repertoire and become hypnotists and make that extra money. Hypnotists do make more money per show per capita or jump on the bandwagon for the grad night post-palm season. Or maybe they want to do fairs and have that diversity of being able to do magic and hypnosis for their fair audience. Anyway, I bring them to a fairgrounds and we spend between five and seven days together. I also teach them audio because I was a broadcasting major. So I've got a strong background and I have a way of being able to teach people sound. And I teach them video and I teach them back of the room sales and I teach them costuming. I teach them the five to seven portions of the show so they understand the fluidity, fluidity, is that a word? Uh, of a show from beginning to end, you know, and we work on their weak points. It's the little things that make a world of difference in their show. So by the time I walk out of this boot camp, I have a, a, a fully formed show or at least a partial show? Everyone that goes to my boot camp can actually go do shows. If you come to the boot camp twice, it's pretty amazing how good you really are. Hmm. I've had people return three and four times because like anything, you go, wow, hey, I didn't realize what I was getting into and I got there and it was like, okay, I learned by you setting me on fire. <laughs> and now I have to come back because I'm prepared for what you're going to make me do. They come back the second time and boy, the, is the learning curve is so dramatic the second time around for most of them. More than 50% of the people that have taken my boot camp, more than 50% of them are now making scale. You know, they're getting that $1,500 for a show. Nice. Consistently making $600 to $2,000. I don't do hypnosis, but the thing that attracts me to it from listening to yourself and some different people is that you don't have to pull a bunch of stuff with you. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> really? I mean, I'm pulling a 20-foot trailer now. Yeah, but I figured that was for your magic stuff. No, well, okay. I am OCD about my sound and the sound quality. Yeah. So I am bringing a full blown sound system. Not huge cabinets. I can lift every cabinet above my head and put them onto a tripod. But I carry three speakers, a mixer, a suitcase full of cables, ah. and tripods. So that's my sound. Then I also have video. All of my video equipment fits into a backpack except for the video tripod depending on where I'm doing the show, whether I'm flying or whether I'm driving, will determine which tripod I bring. And it doesn't hurt if you have props. And it doesn't hurt if you have your own wireless microphones always because you can't depend on them to give you good equipment. That's right. You know, they're going to hand you Navy and Samson and Radio Shack equipment. Yeah. It drives me crazy to hear that hiss and buzz in the background. I don't have the best stuff but I've got good stuff and I'm constantly upgrading it all the time. Sure. And I carry extras too. I carry three microphones and a fourth wireless for doing my own sound wirelessly. And I carry a headset and that's just for two of us. We don't need three microphones. We only need two, yeah. but I carry that third one in case one of them craps out. If I have two headsets, one I use and one is a backup. Yeah. Cause you never know. Yeah. So before we were talking here on the show, uh, we were talking about multiple streams of income. And this is really important to especially entertainers like myself. I have three different things going on, three different ways of, of making money. Why is that important? And, and, and what are you doing? Well, why is it important? You know, there's seasons when we're not busy. If you have some income coming in because you have a retail store online, you do some other service that you enjoy or it makes you good money and get you through the rough spots. Mm. So yeah, I've got about five or six different streams of income. Mm. You know, my father was a very well noted magician and inventor of magic tricks. And I inherited all of his books and all of his products. So I also have George magic.com, which is my store for selling my father's creations as I improve on them and 
make them prettier. Mm -hmm. And then I have the hypnosis boot camp, and that makes me twice as much as if I was going to do the county fair myself mm. as a performer. But it's a lot of work. I mean, I work twice as hard at a boot camp, uh, three times as hard at a boot camp as I would if I was just doing the fair. Because mm -hmm. if I'm doing the fair, you do two shows and you go home or you go to the gym or you go to a restaurant and you relax. When I'm doing the boot camp, I have to get six, seven shows off the ground every single day for multiple days in a row. I have to videotape them. I have to make sure the audio is set up correctly. I have to babysit seven different personalities, yeah. you know, get them to and from the fairgrounds. That's, a, that's, that's four right there. So that's the boot camp, hypnosis, your dad's product. P&O permits. The P&O permits. I run a talent agency. Oh, and a talent agency that you've had for over 30 years. Alan Sands Entertainment. Hmm. I've been doing, you know, marketing other variety specialty and novelty acts forever. What, what, what did you call the, the, the passes, the, um, the visas? What did you call those? It's an O and P permit. Now, what is that? Let's go with P permit for a moment. Okay. A P1A is for an athletic team of people to come to the United States and do what they do, whether it's a basketball team, a football team. They need to have a visa to come to the USA and work legally. To work in the US, you need a visa. The okay. reason is we have you know, the third largest population in the world, and our government wants to make sure that Americans work first. Now, if you have extraordinary ability, if you are an up and coming artist, if you have awards, if you are unique, if you're in demand, then they also want you to come here and do what you do for American audiences. So the P1B is for circus troops and other types of entertainment entities. Mostly circus troops is kind of what I think of. An O is for an individual. So an O lasts for three years, a P lasts for one year. It really does cost thousands of dollars to try and file one of these. It's a lot of paperwork. So how are you involved in helping these people get their visas? Yeah, that's a great question. About 23 years ago, my agency sold an act to Disney. They were two Canadian acrobats. They had originally toured with the first touring troupe of Cirque du Soleil. They met on tour. They created their own act that they called the Tesseract. Mm -hmm. And it was a giant jack that was about 12 feet. Each rod was 12 feet long. And if you stood it on end, it was about 15 feet tall. They did acrobatics on this giant jack, rolling it around, doing what would be considered trapeze moves. Mm -hmm. But the trapeze was on an angle. It was very difficult to do. They had this very unique act. Disney purchased that act through my agency for Epcot Center and gave them a six-month contract. Okay. At that time, there was a woman by the name of Barbara, and she worked for Disney, and she did the P1 permits for the international performers working at Disney. Then she broke off from Disney and began to write her own P1s for variety acts and started her own business. Peter and Nino, the two acrobats, got in touch with her, and we put together a troupe of unique Canadian cream de la creme performers that Peter and Nino knew very well. Everyone from Sean Farquhar and his wife, Lori, yeah. to Greg Fruin, who yep. is David Copperfield of Niagara Falls and has his own theater there, Murray Hatfield and Teresa, are the magicians on the permit. The underground circus is Peter and Nino's circus troupe. And there's about eight of them now that rehearse together and they're all out of BC, Canada. Then there's a scattering of other people. You interviewed Andrew Pogson. Oh yeah. With Fusion. Andrew was on my permit forever. He had to break off and start his own permit as of recently because his business just grew too big. Mm. We have about 30 plus performers in total that are on the permit. We are a circus troupe. I look for variety acts that are unique and can add to our troupe. So one of them is the world record fire eater. 
and another one is a strong man, and another one is a contortionist that shoots a bow and arrow with her feet. Mm -hmm. Some of them are buskers from Germany and Australia and England, and I do the Glastonbury Festival, so if I find an act there that is really unique and can add to our permit and our troop, I might bring them in and add them. A law firm will charge you anywhere from five to $10,000 to do a P or an O permit. Wow. And Barbara was able to create a method where if you had a group of people, let's say a dozen to 20 people, they would each put in two to $400. Mm. That would make enough money that it was worth the time and effort and cost involved in doing the permit. Now, the costs involved, just to go over this so that people clearly understand, I have to create the permit, and I actually have to make four copies of it, and it goes into one-inch notebooks that are breaking at the seam. I really need one-and-a-half-inch notebooks now. Okay. I create this permit. It takes me about a week or two to actually photocopy all the paper and do all the paperwork, and then I have to send one copy to New York City for an AGVA union approval letter, mm -hmm. AGVA is the American Variety Artists, yep. and they send it back after two weeks with their approval, which is just a single piece of paper, and that costs $300 for their approval, and it costs me two FedEx envelopes going there and coming back. Mm -hmm. So it's about $400 there. The actual I-129 form, which all visas are done on, costs about $400 to apply to Homeland Security, and it'll take three months for them to approve it. Now, what do you think they're looking for for approval? They want to know that you're unique, that you're extraordinary. That's it. That you have an ability that makes you in demand. They're not looking for birthday party magicians. Right. They're not looking for run-of-the-mill clowns unless you have been invited to come and perform at a prestigious festival or something. So if the Magic Castle wants you to come and perform at the Magic Castle and you live in Canada, then that gives you some legitimacy that mm. you are above board and you're you know, a little bit better than the average. Okay. Or if you've been invited to a busking festival and you're going to multiple busking festivals across the USA, then that might be considered extraordinary or exceptional talent because you're unique enough that these festivals want you to come to the US. And you're talking about performers from not just Canada, but from any country going to the US, right? Yeah, at this point, we have one woman from Germany. She's the one that does the bow and arrow while doing a headstand. I think I've seen her. There's a number of them. There, there's a half a dozen of them that do it. But yeah, it's a pretty unique thing. So if you're only one of a dozen, yeah, um, or you have Guinness World Records for being a sword swallower or a fire eater, then that makes you a little bit more in demand and unique. We're going to do the Variety Artist's favorite game show. It's called Fact or Something John Just Made Up. All right. Is it fact? Or is it something John just made up? Ah. I'm going to give you a headline. You're going to tell me whether it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it. Let's do it. First headline. Alan was once twisting balloons at Fisherman's Wharf. A pregnant woman was in his space with a sign that read, Pregnant, live in Fresno, need help to get home. Is that true or false? Is that true or false? All right. It wasn't me. I sent you that one. Oh! <laughs> It wasn't me. It was one of my friends. And actually, it was Paul and Steve. They were balloon clowns that taught me how to work the streets when I first arrived here. And, and they were drunks. They were alcoholics. And one day, they go down to Fisherman's Wharf to make money to buy beer. Okay. In the spot is this woman with a sign that says, I'm nine months pregnant. I live in Fresno. I need money to go home. Please help. So they went a block down the street, put out a sign that said, we banged up some lady from Fresno. We need money to get out of town. Please help. <laughs> and 
It's just my favorite street performing story because I can't help but crack up as I tell it. And I've been telling it for over 30 years. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know where to go. Oh, I'll just go to the next headline because I, <laughs> I don't know where to go from there. Next headline. Alan once sat for hours in front of a mirror to see if he could hypnotize himself. I don't look in the mirror, so that definitely wouldn't be me. If I have to look in the mirror, it's time to go get a haircut. The advantage is to being a guy. Uh, no, that wouldn't be me. Sorry, that was false. I made that one up, yeah. All right, final headline. At certain fairs, Alan made more money passing the hat than any other way. Yeah, that, that one's actually true. Oh. I, I got to work at the Alaska State Fair a number of times, and I was good friends with one of the ex-managers, Joe Lawton. And he would buy acts from me for one of his stages. And one year, I talked him into letting me be the stage manager on one of his bigger stages for all the acts during the day. Then after the stage closed with the scheduled acts, I was allowed to get up there and do a hypnosis show and I passed the hat. What was interesting about it was that hypnosis shows, you always have back of the room sales. The advantage I had was that I was making VHS tapes at the time and I had a rack or two racks with eight VCRs. I was able to sell the videotapes following the show even though I'd pass the hat and I'd make a hundred bucks passing the hat, I would also sell 10 to 15 videos at 20 bucks a pop. Oh. And I was making anywhere from 300 to $600 a night doing back of the room sales and passing the hat, doing one show each night. That was back. Ooh. Or something John just made up. Ah. We're going to get into some fan questions. How about some fan questions, Alan? Okay, yeah. I have fans. That's amazing. Yes, you do. Yeah, every, every time I interview somebody new, I put on my Facebook group, the Variety Arts Community Facebook group, that you can ask questions, ask me questions that I will ask of our guest. So here we are. Adam Gertzikov, he is a clown out of Rhode Island and writes a very popular blog called Clown Link. You got to visit that. Says... I performed in Canada a few times, and it seems that each time I'm told something different. At one point, I was told I could work and bring in my artistic show as an arts exchange, as long as the venue wasn't primarily a bar. Another time, I was told that I could perform as long as they didn't charge tickets. And another time, I worked in Canada for a theater for the summer, but they paid me in American dollars via an American bank, so it wasn't actually employment. I am so confused. Okay. That's like five different questions. Uh, yeah. There's a form online called a 105. So if you look up Canada Employment 105, mm -hmm. it's going to spell it out pretty clearly for anybody that wants to read the actual regulations for working in Canada. Everything he said is true. If they are selling tickets, when you get to the border, you're supposed to buy a work permit. And you can purchase it right at the border from immigration. And I think it's $175 Canadian the last time I talked to them. Mm -hmm. I have only had to buy one once because normally I'm working at a county fair. And a county fair may be charging tickets to get into the fair, but they're not charging tickets to see my show. Right. If you're a band and you're performing at a bar, and they're charging a door charge, you are the entertainment. And therefore, you're going to have to buy a work permit for everyone in your band to work in Canada. Individually. Yeah, probably everyone in the band would have to buy one. But if you're bringing your girlfriend up with you and she's not officially working, then you probably would not need to buy the work permit. Hmm. The other thing to know is that if you make more than 15,000 Canadian, you need to pay taxes in Canada. If you make less than $15,000 in a fiscal year, you do not have to pay taxes in Canada, but you still have to file a piece of paper with your employer, whoever's writing you the check or checks, 
the form is the 105. They have a short form now. And all you have to do is fill out a single page, send it to your employer, and they have to hold on to that piece of paper for six years in case Revenue Canada asks them to present it. Mm. For us to work in Canada, pretty easy. If you have a contract, when you get up to the border, be honest with them as you cross the border. There was once a time when I was late because I was going to dinner with a bunch of performers Mm. in Winnipeg and I wanted to cross the border and get to the dinner and I sat in the line for 45 minutes and I was in a rush and I was actually going to go perform in Brandon, Manitoba, down the highway, about 100 kilometers from Winnipeg after dinner and I was going to be there for a fair and when I pulled up to the window, I didn't tell them I was going to Brandon to perform. I said, no, I'm going across the border to have dinner with a bunch of friends. And they knew it. (laughs) I had already filled out the forms for my Revenue Canada tax exemption. They had me pull over and they started interrogating me. Uh. And I could have gotten in a lot of trouble. But while I'm sitting there in the border agent's office, I stood up and I walked up to the counter and I said, excuse me, gentlemen, officers, I have a confession to make. (laughs) I have a job and I'm going to the job tomorrow and I'll be there for six days. And I was trying to get over the border quicker. This is where you'll find my contract, yada, yada. And they said, it's a really good thing you confessed because number one, we knew. Number two, it's immigration felony land when you lie to an agent. Oh. I could have been not only deported, but probably arrested or whatever for it. They let me go, but they also gave me a list of laws. They showed me in the book where the list of regulations were, when you need a work permit and when you don't. Mm. You don't need a work permit to work in Canada if you're going up there to work for a fair and a festival an event where, oh, like a corporate party, because they're not selling tickets to the corporate party. Right. I hope that answers it for them. Yeah, I think that did. You know, that seems to be a blessing in disguise because you learned a lot about things that you may not have known at the time. Well, I educate myself on it. I really do want to read that extra three pages of rules and regulations to get to know what I'm dealing with Mm -hmm. when I'm working internationally. Right. I have not read the rules and regulations for going to England, even though I go there every year. But the festival does my visa, and it's the only job I do when I'm there. As long as you make it there and back, you're fine. Canada's a little bit closer, and I go there a lot more often. So I've got to know those rules a little more. Graham Rogers, an excellent magician out of Phoenix, Arizona, asks, once you have, uh, this is a hypnosis question. Uh, Once you have done your training, written your script and all, How did it feel doing your first show? The fear of maybe getting nobody under? How did you overcome that fear? Boy, you know, you do house parties. You you do smaller events where, you know, I'm a different animal personally because my father did hypnosis and he did magic. And when I was in high school, I began hypnotizing some of my classmates playing with it at house parties. You know, there were cast parties after the school play. We would play with it. And I had success. Then when I began to do it more professionally, what I would do is I would set up my magic act and keep it backstage or on the side of the stage. And that way, if I was failing and nobody volunteered or nobody went under, I could grab my magic act and pull it out and still do a strong show because my Mm. magic act was polished and I had something to fall back on. And even though the client had hired me to do hypnosis, I still entertained them and I did a good show. But it sounds like if, if someone's doing your boot camp, they don't have to worry about that because they've already gotten on stage and done it. Yeah, well, if you do the boot camp, that really helps you immensely because you will fail and you'll watch other people fail. Some people are just so seasoned and ready to go when they get there because they were clinical hypnotherapists. So they do have a good induction, Mm. but they may not have the routines under their belt to make the show flow and be happy and funny. Right. That's what they're learning or they're learning the pre-talk because they don't work on a microphone very often or at all. And they're learning how to handle a microphone. They're learning their music. So by the time they're done with that, they know what's going on. Yeah. You just got to get out there and fail. 
You can't be afraid to fail. Hypnosis is one of those where even the very best pros find that they have tough shows because the audience didn't want to participate. Or only three people show up in the audience. <laughs> yeah. Uh, small audiences can be a real challenge. Yeah. You know, that's something that the boot camp teaches you also, because sometimes at the county fair, you may only have an audience of 12 to 15 people sitting in the audience, mm. or you'll have an audience of 30 to 50, and you'll have good shows and you'll have tougher shows. You learn, okay, wow, I can get through those tougher shows. Or I had all synambulists, people that just sat there comatose and didn't animate. Wait, wait, what did you call them? Synambulists? Yeah, it's called synambulism. When they sit there, in a very deep state of hypnosis, and they see it in their mind, they hear everything you're saying, they're in a dream state, but they don't animate. And it's not real entertaining to the audience, but boy, they're dancing and they're freezing and they're sweating and they're laughing. It's all going on in their head like a dream. Uh -huh. A lot of cultural groups will have, because they meditate or they chant, they will go into synambulism rather than animating. Mm -hmm. Misty and I recently did a Native American First Nation staff party for a casino in Wyoming. In one show, we had six people go under. In both shows, we had six people go under. We did two shows for the staff. In the first show, three of them were animated. In the second show, all six of them sat there and did not move. Oh, it's a nightmare. But after the show, we were talking to them and they said, oh yeah, I was doing it in my head. And I did learn after the show that we should have had Native American music and had them do Native American dancing and we would have touched their spirit and they would have gotten up and danced in their traditional way. And we would have been very successful then had we put a Native American music routine of drumming into the show and let them go there. So next time you get hired for a Native American corporate party, you'll, you'll be ready. And it also makes me think about, let's say, people from India. They also can be meditators and not be animated, mm -hmm. but they do go into a deep meditative state. Maybe I need to add some you know, music that they're familiar with that makes them want to move. That might be an interesting topic of conversa conversation with somebody of Indian and yeah. descent. Yeah, or just try it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just try it. <laughs> yeah, just, just get it up there and see what happens. Yeah, right. All right, so how about, how about some advice for the beginner or the pro? Number one, start journaling. Journal every single place you perform. Journal all the exciting things you're going to do in this business because you're going to look back on this list and look at all these moments that you spent doing things that were amazing, that are going to make everyone else jealous of the fact that you, I slept on the Great Wall of China. Mm -hmm. I watched the videotape of the Star Spangled Banner in this national park on July 4th. <laughs> That's cool. In Maryland, I forget the Fort McKinley, I forget which fort it was. You know, all these things that you do in your life, the places that you stay, the national parks you drive through, keep a log, keep a journal, put it in your iPhone as a list. Yeah, I do something every year called Jar of Good. And I think I've said this before, but every time something good or something fun happens, you know, I jot it down. And then at the end of the year, I dump out all those little, in fact, I'm, I need to do that. I dump out all those little pieces of paper and I review the entire year. Mm -hmm. and it's kind of cool looking at those little pieces of paper and saying, oh yeah, I remember when I did this or I remember when I did, yeah, it, it makes me feel great. It does. It really does. Because when I go back and I read my list and I go, oh yeah, wow, I've been to over 50 national parks. That's so cool. Yeah, you, you do kind of forget until you look at those journals and you go, wow, that was really right. cool. And then I was working at the um, Lagoon, which is an amusement park outside of Salt Lake City. And we were only working Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And we had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off every week. And we would jump in the car and we would drive down to the national parks that were down in southern Utah. So that was that same summer that I saw all four or five of those national parks. Advice for the new guy. Hey, make sure you're around like-minded people. Oh. Y your mom might be an accountant, but you got to hang around other performers. You got to hang around other comedians, other artists, 
people that are better than you also pick their brains, carry their bags, drive them to the show, do whatever the hell you have to do to be around people who know the business, people who you're going to learn from. And you're not going to learn in leaps and bounds. You're only going to learn little tiny morsels, but those little morsels add up to being the best. People that have those little tiny morsels that are so much better than the person who doesn't have them. And uh, get a director. Make sure you let people critique you all the time, whether it's by video. I videotape every single show I do. Every magic show, every hypnosis show. If I play games, because I do a company picnic games package, I videotape all of them. Hopefully I can have people look at them and critique them for me. I'm always open to criticism. I've heard enough compliments in my life. I want criticism. Yeah. Surround yourself with people who are better than you at things that you don't want to do or don't have time to do. So I have a graphic artist and he's been with me for about 14 years now. Hmm. I started him out just making postcards for me and doing little manipulations in my photos. He now has hard drives filled with photographs, documents that he can draw from. He builds websites for me. Find people that are better than you in things that you need done and pay them to do it. And it's going to save you a lot of time and you're going to be much happier with your end product. That's something I've learned as I've gotten older. It's, it's much better to pay somebody who does think I can't do everything as much yeah. as I'd like to pretend that I can do everything. I can't. Yeah. There are people that build websites way better than me. Absolutely. Logos way better than me. And they charge a lot of money because they're good. But yeah. after you pay them and the money's gone, you have a product that lasts you for years. That's right. Sometimes forever. Yeah. I mean, I recently got a bid from a videographer who does video editing and his bid was really, really high and I don't have the money right now. Yeah. But I'm going to find the money in the next year and get him onto that project because I know he's good and those videos will last me for uh, six, seven years. Well, that's the thing that that $5,000 investment is going to make you hundreds of thousands of dollars over the yeah. years. Yeah, absolutely. It will pay dividends over and over and over again. All right. So how about a recommended book? Recommended book. I got four of them. <laughs> four of them? Okay. All of them are not magic books. Bring them on. None of them are hypnosis books. They are all business and performance related books. The first one that changed my life entirely was called Life is a Contact Sport by Ken Cragen. It is out of print. You have to buy a used copy. And those used copies are less than $5 or $6 on eBay. Life is a Contact Sport by Ken Cragen. And I can't talk high enough, high, highly enough about this book, but it literally changed my entire life when I read it 27 years ago. Hmm. Ken Cragen was or is the personal manager for Kenny Rogers and hmm. Trisha Yearwood. And he put together Hands Across America and We Are the World. He was the main focus, the person that put all those projects together. Wow. Talks about 10 points that every entertainer, specifically entertainers, but you can translate it into other things, should be aware of and be conscious of and how to build your career. Ken Cragen, Life is a Contact Sport. And you have three more? The book that I'm reading right now, Maximum Entertainment 2.0. Oh my God. Oh, I think you're the fourth or fifth person that's recommended that. Oh my God. I haven't read it yet. Is it great? Oh, it's so easy to read. He had amazing editors tear it apart and build it again and tear it apart and don't buy version one. Don't buy the first version because he literally took the first version as he explains in the table of contents. He took the first version and simply rewrote it. So you don't need version one and version two, just pay the 40 bucks for version two. Ah, I have a terrible reading comprehension and I am eating this book up every single word of it, every page. I can't put it down. Okay. You've convinced me. I've had three or four other people recommend it, but now you've convinced me. Oh, yeah. It's 40 bucks. Go to your local brick and mortar shop and order it, okay? Because it's still going to be 40 bucks. Support your local brick and mortar magic store. Or you can go on my website and just click on it and, and, and support your local podcast. Okay. That'll work too. <laughs> Either way. Hey, um, the easiest magazine, the easiest one to read. It was written by a magician. 
It's by Quentin Reynolds, How to Present Yourself to an Audience. And it's 28 pages. It's just morsel, 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 bite after bite of things that you should do. The laws of being an entertainer that we all need to abide by, he reinforces them. Quentin Reynolds, How to Present Yourself to an Audience. Okay, one last one. Last one. ABZs of Magic by Rob Zabrecki. It's a new publication. Okay. Uh, Rob Zabrecki has been the American representative for FISM. He is a regular at the Magic Castle. And this is his lecture that they put into a book with 26 pointers on how to be a performer and how to be a successful entertainer, how to get yourself out of the bun and into the tortilla shell. Wait, wait, out of the bun, into the tortilla shell? What? <laughs> it's an old Taco Bell ad. <laughs> anyway, um, oh, well, that's right. That's right. It was. Uh... <laughs> it's ABZs of Magic by Rob Zabrecki. Yeah, I'll put all four of those on my website and you just click, click away, go to Amazon, grab them. Yeah. Well, thanks, Alan. This was fun, man. This was great. I've run out of things to talk about. That's okay. I'm, I'm glad I finally got a chance to talk to you one-on-one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wealth of information of, of the, the travel thing and the hypnosis thing. And, and I love your podcast, man. I, I really do. It is absolutely one of my favorites. I do not get tired of it. I get tired of listening to Penn Jillette. I get tired of listening to, what's his name? The Alligator. Yeah. I, I get tired of all of them. I haven't gotten tired of yours. There's so much variety. Well, thanks. The way you're doing it is just awesome. It's really brilliant. You're so nice. Like I keep on saying, you know, learn from people better than you. You are getting people on there that are better than me. I learn so much from them. I got to tell you, I learn something from every single interview that I do. I bet you do. Yeah, I do. I bet you do. All right, well, thank you, my friend. Thanks to all my variety artists. You found this uh, podcast valuable. Spread the word. Tell at least one friend this week. Tell your enemies. Tell everyone. Tell everyone. Tell, tell all your friends. And keep an eye out for my brand new store. You'll be able to get there through my website. I'll be making the official announcement on my Facebook page and on next week's podcast. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.